All right. Hi. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to present this work at HPG and also to the broader audience from the EGSR. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity. This is my first time to be this wonderful campus. It's very nice to travel seven hours from the US to the Europe. Uh, and also I want to make clear that this the main contribution from this uh, in this work is from my students. Uh, so uh, they are PhD students, uh, but because of the time, not enough to get the visa. So I'm their representative in here. So I will try my best to make the work clear. Uh, and hopefully you will like it. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, in this work, we present a parallel algorithm for segmenting the mesh into a balanced mesh structure. Um, so by saying balanced, uh, we actually mean the submeshes, as you can see in the figure, is going to contain an equal number of triangles. Uh, this structure has the potential to improve the utilization of parallel computing architecture in you know, many geometry uh, processing applications, such level detail, many people already talked about that, uh, and also maybe uh, mesh compression. We're going to show some you know, testing we have done with these two applications at the end of the, this slide. Um, so uh, let me use a GPU example uh, to illustrate our motivation why we do this type of segmentation. Uh, so GPU design, as we know, this with array of streaming multiprocessors uh, and that manage blocks of threads uh, with uh, accessing to the same shared memory. Uh, so when we have a mesh, uh, the vertices and triangles is uh, going to be organized as arrays, like buffer objects. Yeah, and then uh, they would have to send over from the CPU to the GPU and maintain it in the global memory. Uh, and uh, then, uh, as we know, they have to maintain there and uh, then the thread is going to access them actually from the uh, global memory. Uh, so what we are thinking about, uh, some new mesh structure is going to be like partition the mesh in this way so that we can organize this uh, complex mesh into sub meshes and they have equal size. And uh, when they maintain in the GPU memory, uh, so we have uh, exact control about their size, and uh, this could be better matching into the hardware requirement uh, so that we can better utilize the GPU memory to do certain applications. Maybe not all the applications, but for the certain application which can benefit from the uh, you know, balanced segmentation could be utilized to share, share memory uh, in, in a better way. Um, so the challenge here is basically has been recognized in the literature. So basically exactly balancing uh, the sub meshes is an NP problem. So we can do this in the CPU, uh, but it will be time consuming. Uh, so we are trying to address this issue by uh, proposing some primary goals. The first goal is basically we want to come up with a strategy so that we can precisely control the triangle counts among the sub meshes. And uh, the second goal would be after they segmented, we want to maintain their two manifold topology in each sub mesh. So this is kind of critical, we think, uh, because uh, uh, if we don't do that, so we may end up with some result like this type of segmentation. So you can see right here some uh, triangles, they are continuous, continuously connected, uh, but they are not through the edges, they are through the points. So this is known as a bow tie issue. It's not money for the issue. So if you do the level of detail, like simplification, those triangles would be considered as uh, boundary triangles. They cannot be further simplified. So we want to minimize this type of issue if we want to really have a nice uh, mesh patch. Uh, so this is the second goal we want to achieve. And also, of course, um, you know, uh, on the GPU architecture, uh, Different GPU have different configuration. So if we have different hardware, we may want to uh, redo the segmentation so the algorithm should be fast enough to help people to you know, reconfigure into different number of sub meshes. Uh, so uh, we look into the literature, we found some people already done the similar work. Uh, so one of the uh, common approaches to use the 
a region grow approach. Uh, so this also has been represented in the uh, talk paper called Arc Smash. Uh, and there are also recent talk paper already uh, discusses as well. So basically they can, you can specify K seed triangles uh, that allow you to customize the number of submeshes and then you just grow them into a continuous patch. So the good thing is that they can maintain the continuity uh, so there is a guarantee that connect, uh, you know, uh, uh, connected through the edges. Uh, but there is lack of support for balancing. So basically there is no guarantee the triangle count is going to be balanced. Um, so another one could be a little bit old, but it's the state of art. So which is called Matisse. If you do the geometry processing, probably this is a well-known library has been used by many uh, researchers. Uh, so this maintains the continue in these conditions. So basically they do have the bauta issue. The code is continuously connected, but it is through the, word, through the vertices. Um, and they do support uh, balancing because they do the bisectional partition. Uh, hierarchically doing this is pretty fast, uh, but it's not exactly balanced. Uh, we'll show you uh, some of the uh, results uh, that we have tested it later. Uh, and there is another one called Jabija. I hope I pronounce this right. Uh, so that basically supports the exact balancing, which is exactly balanced the number of triangles. However, there will be some serious issue in continuity. So it's not continuously connected patch. Uh, so this comes up with the overall overview of our approach. Uh, we're using a different domain, not in the 3D domain. We're using the spherical domain. So I'll show you why we want to use it. There is a performance consideration that could be accelerated if we do the measurement in this domain. Uh, so first of all, we have to do the spherical parameterization, basically uh, convert a 3D mesh uh, into a spherical representation. And then we randomly initialize the labels. So label is means the sum mesh label. So we don't care which label is assigned to which triangle, we just do uh, the random initialization, so it would be appear like this, very colorful random colors. Uh, so we propose a new algorithm called the Caucasian algorithm uh, that start with this chaos, and we're going to group in the triangle, uh, excuse me, into the submeshes. Uh, so basically at the core of the execution, it would be uh, parallelize the label swapping operations. So basically, if we have different, like two triangles as a pair, we're going to uh, examine do we need to swap them in order to let the nearby triangle to be coherent. Uh, so after that, uh, it will be something like this. Uh, it's still in the spherical domain. Uh, and there will be some issues, as you can see, there are little triangles, blue triangles. It does have a bauta issue. So this algorithm is not perfect. It cannot resolve the the things we want to resolve. So we have another algorithm called the refinement that's going to improve uh, the smoothness of the boundary. Uh, less boundary edge would be better uh, for a geometry processing. Uh, and also we try to remove such uh, about high issue. And eventually we're going to convert this domain into the 3D domain so we get the mesh segmented. Um, so this is general idea we have. So the critical thing is go basically the label swapping. So we start with the randomization uh, assigning the uh, labels. Uh, and I'm going to use an example to illustrate how we do the swapping. Uh, so let's say we have uh, uh, two sub in here at an uh, intermediate uh, step. And then uh, we do have uh, pick one pair of triangle. Uh, and we're going to decide, do we need to swap these two labels? Uh, obviously, you can directly figure out we should, right? So, so basically, uh, we do some measurement. The first thing is going to uh, calculate the, the centroid position of the sub mesh. So the blue sub mesh, the centroid position is here. The yellow patch, the centroid mesh, uh, centroid position is here. And then we also do the same thing uh, for the pair of the triangles, finding their central position. And uh, uh, we compute the distance between uh, the submesh and the triangle, which is belong to the same submesh. Uh, and we are going to uh, record their distance. 
uh, and we're going to assume that uh, the triangle has been swapped with the labels. So their label already swapped. Uh, and we do the same measurement on the distance. So basically, we got the D3 and D4 in this, uh, you know, uh, labels in here. Uh, we sum them together. So as you can see, this is before swapping, this is after swapping. And we can just measure if the distance becomes smaller, so they are going to be better coherent into a, uh, you know, nearby group. So this is uh, our uh, uh, strategy in here. Uh, so in this case, uh, it does need to be swapped in order to have a better uh, result. Uh, so the critical part in here is would be uh, how should we choose the distance measurement. So one of the uh, common use approach would be you know, uh, geodesic distance. Uh, so this has been used and presented in many papers. Right? So it's basically defined the minimum path connecting two triangles. In, case, in our case, it would be triangles. So it's very precise. It's computed in surface domain, doesn't need a sphere. Uh, and, but this is expensive, okay? Because you have to go through the topological connection and it's hard to do the computation in parallel. Uh, in our case, uh, this uh, geodesic distance is actually represents uh, the minimum number of edges on the dual graph or triangle. So in this example, this could be something like this. Um, so, as I just mentioned, also, uh, you know, evaluated in the uh, uh, literature, uh, people have found this is definitely computational uh, costly. Um, so, we found an uh, alternative solution. So, uh, we parameterize things onto the sphere, and we can use a core distance as an estimation to measure such distance. It's not precise, it's not going to be accurate, but it's fast. It's a measure distance at constant time. Uh, so, and also it can preserve the correctness of comparison. So as you can see in the algorithm, uh, distance doesn't have to be accurate, but the comparison has to be correct. So we care about the correct of the comparison, so we choose this faster computation approach. Uh, but, you know, as you know, we do require this thing had to be in the spherical parameterization. Uh, so, so that's uh, basically what we do uh, for the uh, label swapping, and we have done this uh, in parallel. Uh, so, in terms of implementation, uh, we evaluate the unique pairs of triangles in um, parallel. So by meaning the unique pairs, we ensure that each triangle is part of its only one other triangle. So this is to avoid the resting conditions on the GPU. Uh, you know, if multiple triangles attempt to swap labels simultaneously, so we would have some resting conditions. Uh, so specifically, we're going to assign the first uh, uh, index part of with the last one the second with the second last, and so on until the middle two are paired. So we kind of, you know, bend the array into like two, two rows, so we can see the, uh, the pairing uh, in a better way. Uh, so, so this is only like one cycle of the repeat. So basically we apply a round robin scheduling method to update the triangle indices, uh, indices in, the, uh, in the pairs. So we're going to start from the second element, so from here, and uh, we're going to shift the index value forward by one. So basically, for example, this ui is going to be equal to ui minus one, and the first one going to be replaced with the last index. Uh, so this is going to be repeated n minus one times uh, uh, to shift uh, uh, the indices and ensure all the triangles pairs are going to be evaluated. So this n minus one time, going, we call it one iteration. So one iteration is now enough to make sure all the sum meshes is into, uh, into their, their correct place. So we're going to iterate uh, many times until there are no triangle pair need to swap. Uh, so they're basically iterative uh, approach, but each each iteration going to be a parallel implementation. 
Uh, so here is a, a video clip uh, we are showing uh, uh, this coherent, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, coherent process. So initialization is uh, is very uh, random, uh, and uh, we also uh, recorded the number of boundary edges during the coherent process, and also the ball ties uh, during the process. So the first few steps is cohere them very fast. So basically, uh, just one or two iterations, you can see they are into some rough uh, shape. Uh, and then we have uh, a few iterations is, uh, during the process, they try to reduce the number of boundary edges and also try to reduce the number of bow, bow tie. So we do have a total of iteration, uh, the number of iteration is 25. So that's kind of uh, stabilized after that. So you can see we do have, still have the issue, and this this is reduced a lot, but still like almost a thousand uh, boundary edges. Uh, okay, so after that, uh, we have the refinement step. Uh, the goal is trying to uh, uh, resolve the bow tie issue and the smoothing the uh, boundaries. As you can see, uh, this one uh, we do have some issue here and uh, some issue. Uh, here, right? So we're trying to resolve them. Um, so uh, for the refinement, the evaluation of the power triangles are quite similar to the coherent process. Uh, the difference is that we are not really measure the distance. We do uh, a measure uh, based on the topological connection uh, in the neighbor triangles. Uh, the first of all, we want to count the number of boundary edges in the pair of triangle. So let's say uh, we still do the uh, you know, triangle pairing like this too. Uh, and then uh, for this a triangle pair, we count the number of boundary edges. Uh, for the yellow one, uh, it has two boundary edge adjacent to the blue sum edge. And so this is between to the yellow, but it's adjacent to the blue with two boundary edge. And this one the same thing, and the way uh, going to record them. And we also look into the neighbor. Uh, so basically, uh, the neighbor is defined as the triangle that have labeled the same sum mesh uh, uh, as, the, as this triangle. So this will be the yellow one with also its neighbor with two boundary, and this neighbor with the one boundary. Uh, so, and we do the similar approach that we assume they have been swapped. We do the same counting for the boundary edges for the triangle pair and the neighbor triangle. Uh, and then we come up with uh, a sum squares uh, 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 method uh, as a cost value uh, for this evaluation. Uh, so, and to compare before the swapping and after swapping. Uh, so uh, if this is cost value becomes smaller of the swapping, we uh, indeed uh, proceed with this swap. Uh, so here's a, a video clip showing uh, the result. Uh, refinement kind of uh, spend much less number of iterations. It only takes three. Uh, and still we have some boundary edges uh, and the way uh, we do remove the bow tie uh, issue in here. Uh, so as you can see, in our approach, the most important part is the input match had to be spherical parameterization uh, because we want to take advantage for the distance measurement. So we don't have contribution in spherical parameterization. We're just taking our existing work. Actually, my team have done this research in different, uh, at a different venue. Uh, so we just use that uh, parameterization approach uh, to uh, create the sphere. Uh, basically, we do the mesh simplification that simplify the high curvature region and embed that high curvature region into the flattened area. So eventually, we get the tetrahedral. Uh, so this is like a feature embedding process. And after that, we're going to insert the vertices back uh, into uh, the 3D space. At the same time, we're going to project this triangle uh, into the sphere. Uh, that would be in the reverse order of the collapsing. So as you can see, uh, this is inserted and pro projected onto the sphere. It's into the local wiring domain. 
So as uh, indicated in this uh, popping purple thing, yeah, you may <laughs> be able to catch that. So that's basically uh, the local space, the local region that the vertex insert into on the sphere. Uh, so here is our result. Uh, we tested with twenty one uh, models. Uh, the largest one we have about half million triangles. The smallest one only have a few thousand triangles in there. Uh, the limitation is actually how complex the model we can do is basically limited by uh, the robustness of the spherical parameterization. We do try to have larger model can be parameterized, but it looks like we have some engineering issues that we get into the floating point errors. So eventually when you insert the vertices, its space is getting small and small. So it's really hard to do actually. So this is one of the future work I think we definitely want to look into. Either finding a distance measurement in surface domain and the fast, or we improve the robustness of spherical parameterization and using this kind of core, core distance. Uh, so that will be some future work. And we uh, conduct a comparison between our approach uh, with region grow and the Matisse. Uh, so this is our approach. So middle wise region grow, this is Matisse. Uh, so uh, here MTCD is stand for the max triangle count difference between any two uh, sub meshes. So as you can see, we have a well balanced number of triangles. You see, there is a most of our one 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 is because uh, the total number of triangles cannot be evenly divided by the uh, number of sub meshes, so but it would be either zero or one. Uh, and uh, Mantis did a good job too in terms of balancing, uh, but region grow is is not uh, that good. It's it's quite have some large uh, imbalancing issue. Um, so uh, also we look into the non-manifold issue, which we call it bowed high. So we re completely remove them, uh, and the region grow also can remove them, right? So and but uh, Matisse is not really uh, uh, able to guarantee that. Okay. Uh, so this one, this column is basically the number of boundary edges. So we uh, check on that, uh, as you can see. Uh, our result is similar to uh, the result of Matisse. So the sub mesh shape is roughly good. Uh, yeah, I think we run out of time. Uh, so there are some other results uh, we kind of evaluated. So there is a non manifold issue in Matisse, and we compared this and enlarged what the issue are. Uh, and we also did some timing result, for example, uh, coherence time. So through the iteration, we're using the human model with 200 sub meshes. As you can see, this is execution time. The first few iteration is, it did most of the job, uh, but it's time consuming. How the most triangle had to be swapped the labels. Uh, and the number of edges is reduced in the first few iterations and then sterilized in the rest. So technically, uh, refinement is more costly in terms of the execution time. So because we look into the neighbors, Right, so that will be uh, much higher than coherence step, but the iteration number is much less. Uh, so we have two testing applications, as I mentioned, one is level detail on the GPU. We didn't do the uh, uh, you know, view dependent level detail, we just do the uh, sub mesh uh, level detail. Uh, so each one is kind of fit into the shared memory, so there is a shared memory usage, as you can see, we are quite high. Uh, and also, uh, there is a ratio of non-collapsibility. So where overs are lower means the boundary edge is minimized. Uh, so, so we also did a mesh compression test. Uh, uh, we use uh, the Google uh, Draco Mesh Compression Library to encode the meshes, and we're testing the decoding time. So this is on the CPU using multi-threading approach, so not on the GPU. So this is. Our uh, approach is able to balance the workload. If you do the CPU, that's a good advantage as well. So as you can see, when the number of triangles is large, so our stuff is more significant, uh, better than others. Uh, for the small meshes, it's not, the difference is not significant. Uh, so in conclusion, we do present two algorithms in spherical domain. And the limitation, obviously, is restricted to the genius zero mesh. 
uh, because they need to be sphere. And possibly we could have a failing case uh, because the local optimal are uh, doing the refinement. Uh, and in the future, we are thinking about maybe we can introduce and handle the seams and open boundaries in order to reduce the genius level. So genius two will be one cut, right? Genius one. But genius two will be two cut, genius one will be one cut. Uh, and also, we definitely want to further uh, investigate the uh, refinement algorithm and improve the spherical parameterization robustness. So also, we can use this to build the building, uh, to build the hierarchical mesh structure. So that could be uh, some promising direction we want to go. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, please sit down. Um, we are quite out of time, but for two questions, maybe we have some time. Yeah. Uh, where's the sphere? Yeah, please move it over there. Oh, you can touch it. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you for the talk. I have a question with you using um, the spherical projection. Does mm -hmm. your method also work for meshes non homeomorphic to spheres, so with torus or other types of topologies? So, so torus, like the donor Does it work shape? with a torus? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, but, could you, but could you map it? Do, could you do your distance measurement on a torus? Yes, we can. But the, the criteria would be a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? So the sphere is easy to the core distance. The, the torus or the donor shape could be some other mathematical uh, equation, but still will be constant time. Yeah. The one other question was a, a fascinating talk. The, the method you have to actually map it to the sphere, have you considered using that to, say, do uh, texture atlas generation? So what did I do? Texture atlas generation, mapping bits of the, the texture into a, into a map. Oh, texture map. Oh, yeah. So that they all get roughly the same amount of area and stuff. It just yeah, seems that's like it could be, be Yeah, that will be uh, quite different directions. Yeah, we should, we should think about that. Um, uh, or... Our motivation is come from the GPU, and what we want to do is kind of like leverage what we have done on the spherical parameterization. <laughs> so, and we kind of find a quick and a matching and approach to do that. Yeah, but definitely I can look into that in the future. Maybe a quick question from myself. And when you go back to the slide where you showed the sphere on the right side and the mesh on the left side, um, I noticed that on the sphere, the segments are very compact, but on the mesh, they are um, pulled quite. Some, uh, uh, sometimes this they are one or? yeah exactly yeah okay they are pulled a bit and are not as compact maybe as on the sphere but this could be problematic maybe for a mesh led carling or something like this have you considered like keeping the compactness of the of the segments also on the mesh because right now it's only in the sphere more oh oh the packing is uh yeah. yes that could be a future work uh, we didn't really com consider the packing is all preserving the semantic meaning for parts mm -hmm. uh during the segmentation so uh, algorithm the result could be different because the initialization is a uh, is a random labeling mm -hmm. uh so uh, over two major goals is one is trying to make sure they continuously connected Second one is to make sure the triangle counts are equally balanced. Uh, so in terms of uh, compaction, path preservation, yeah, it's not really considered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. But, yes, thank you for the question. So I would like thank, to thank all of the speakers today. Really great talk. Thank you.